Hello, my name is Frank Downing, Director of Research for Next Generation Internet at ARC, and I'm really excited to walk through our Artificial Intelligence section of Big Ideas 2024 today. Artificial Intelligence is an innovation platform that we've centered our research around since ARC was really founded in 2014. Uh, and I'm, I'm really excited to go through this section today in part because 10 years later, we're still continually amazed by how quickly costs are coming down, how rapidly performance is improving, uh, and now, uh, really more than any time in ARC's history, how relatable this subject is because of this iPhone-like moment of the launch of ChatGPT at the end of 2022. So we're now a little bit over a year in. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I'm excited to hand it over to Joseph Soya, our research associate focused on AI at ARC, uh, to dive in. When talking about how AI has evolved over the past year, it's hard not to start with ChatGPT and the incredible adoption it's seen early on. ChatGPT reached 100 million users in only two months after its release. And for context on just how fast that is, TikTok took almost a year to reach the same number of users. YouTube and Facebook took about four to four and a half years each. So 100 million users in two months is fairly unprecedented. A big part of why adoption has been so quick is that LLMs fundamentally change how we interact with computers. AI models aren't new. Recommendation models have been running behind the scenes for some time. But ChatGPT has brought AI front and center by allowing people to interact with compute via natural language. Now anyone can use AI, not just developers. And the interest in AI that this has generated isn't limited to consumers. Enterprises latched onto it as well, with mentions of AI on earnings calls of major tech companies more than tripling after the introduction of ChatGPT. What's exciting is that this uptick in interest isn't just hype. We're already seeing evidence of real productivity gains for software developers and consultants. When GitHub released their AI coding assistant, GitHub Copilot, they observed a more than 2x improvement in task completion speed for developers on certain coding tasks. Likewise, the Harvard Business School and the Boston Consultant Group conducted a study of over 700 consultants and found that on average, consultants completed their tasks 25% faster with access to ChatGPT compared to those without. What's even more interesting is that the quality of the work the consultants produced increased as well, especially for consultants that typically underperformed their peers. The HBS study first graded the performance of the consultants on tasks without giving them access to generative AI and grouped the consultants into top and bottom 50th percentiles based on their performance. They then looked at how generative AI improved the quality of the work done by the bottom 50th percentile of workers and the top 50th percentile of workers. And what they saw is that access to GPT-4, the model that powers ChatGPT, improved the quality of the work of the overperformers by an average of 17%, but it improved the task quality of the underperformers by an average of 43%, narrowing the gap between the top and bottom performers. To put this another way, without AI, the bottom 50% of consultants performed only 78% as well as the top 50% without AI. With AI, the gap narrowed such that the bottom 50% of performers scored 96% as well as the top performers. Besides what we're seeing in current state performance with these models, which is already really impressive, uh, I think it's important to take a step back and look at how quickly performance is advancing, uh, even since the launch of ChatGPT, which is powered by the GPT-3 foundation model. Uh, and when we look across a series of benchmarks, uh, what's really astounding to us is that these models uh, with a broad range of foundational capabilities are improving across many different domains. Uh, take law, for example. Uh, GPT-3 scored a 10th percentile on the universal bar exam, uh, meaning that nine out of 10 people that took that test were scoring higher than uh, the AI model. And Around one year later, after the GPT 3.5 release that that benchmark was based on, GPT-4 was able to score a 90th percentile, meaning by adding more training data and more human feedback into the model, OpenAI was able to improve performance by nine times, and the model is now better than nine out of 10 people that take that test. And that's not an isolated incident. Uh, the model improved across many domains, like you can see on the slide here. And while GPT-4 is widely known, at least at time of recording, as one of the most capable models across a wide variety of domains, uh, other models seem to be specializing in one area or another. Claude 2 from Anthropic is a great example where it actually outperforms GPT-4 on several tests relating to uh, analytical uh, and general writing capabilities. We'd be remiss to only be speaking about language models or text in, text out models like a, a GPT 3.5 or a GPT 4, for example, uh, because there's also been a rapid pace of advancement on image models, which are powered by a, a type of uh, a neural network called diffusion models. 
Uh, and when we look at uh, what's going on in this space as well, uh, we see similar trends of rapidly improving capabilities. We've gone back and looked at the responses to a single prompt, a herd of elephants walking across a green grass field, and compared what we saw in what is believed to be one of the first text-to-image models, a line draw from 2016, and compared that to the different generations of mid-journey that have come out over the last two years. Uh, and, and the results really bring to life how this um, capability improvement is unfolding over time. And so you can see here on a line draw in 2016, when asked this question of creating a, a graphic image of elephants walking across a field, uh, the model struggles to create a, a novel scene and is really reproducing in a grainy fashion uh, in what looks like to be images related to its training data set. As in, it's not really generating new content based on the prompt, it's more retrieving data that it, that it you know, quote unquote remembers. Uh, when you go to Midjourney version one, which came out in February of 2022, uh, so that's six years later than the Align Draw release, uh, we're now creating new content, but the model doesn't get it right. It, it confuses green grass with green elephants, which of course isn't the right color. Uh, so that's progress, but it's not really what you'd call production ready to use in a graphic design workflow, for example. Uh, fast forward just a few months in the same year, and, and Midjourney v4 uh, and the more recently released v6 have really pushed the capability um, or the frontier of capability forward in a meaningful way, where now we're getting to photorealistic images uh, that you could see would be directly useful in, in, in a variety of cases. Uh, so now we're, we're at this really exciting point where uh, AI models are producing professional level content uh, in a fraction of the time and for a fraction of the cost. When we think about the models that were released last year, they're not just disrupting trends from the past five years, they're also disrupting long-term trends, such as the cost of authored word. For the past century, the cost of authoring written content has hovered around $300 to $400 per thousand words. That is, the cost you would pay someone to write a thousand word article has been around $300 to $400 for the last hundred years. By contrast, GPT-4 can produce analytic writing at the median GRE level quality for about 16 cents per thousand words. And this trend is continuing downward. Claude 2 can produce top decile GRE analytic writing for about 4 cents per thousand words. The cost declines to produce written content are a great example of one of the things ARC looks for when assessing emerging technologies. Are the costs falling quick enough to enable this technology to spread across uh, the economy and get mass adoption? And we think artificial intelligence is at that sweet spot right now. A great example is looking at the cost to train AI models, where we've seeked to uh, deconstruct what's leading to uh, performance advances and cost declines uh, in excess of Moore's law, which is one of the commonly used uh, measures of cost declines in the semiconductor space. Uh, whereas Moore's law says that the cost of semiconductors are cut in half roughly every two years, uh, we've seen AI uh, training capability increasing somewhere between 3 to 5x per year per dollar, uh, which is pretty remarkable. And you can see on this chart some of those things that stack up, uh, which are really a combination of hardware advances from chip designers like NVIDIA, plus uh, algorithmic software improvements that researchers are finding, uh, like chinchilla, chinchilla scaling, for example, uh, or even including something like speculative decoding on the inference side, which uh, just that uh, discovery alone improved infer inference performance by two to three X. And zooming out from the picture of the advances we've seen just over the last year, ARC likes to model cost declines against Wright's law, which compared to Moore's law is not a function of time, uh, Moore's law saying costs fall in half every, uh, roughly every two years, but a function of units, saying that costs decline at a constant rate uh, for every cumulative doubling of units produced. A and AI, right now, all the investment we're seeing in the space, we're rapidly seeing more and more cumulative doublings. And so as you can imagine, costs are falling very quickly. So we've used Wright's law to model cost declines at, on artificial intelligence training in particular at 75% per year. So rather than Moore's law, which suggests that costs are falling in half every two years, this 75% cost decline suggests that costs are falling in half every six months. And these cost declines are not limited to just AI training. We're actually seeing cost declines in excess of 75% per year on the inference side. Just looking at OpenAI's listing price for the GPT 3.5 and GPT 4 APIs, we've observed costs falling at an 86% annualized rate for GPT 3.5 and at a 92% annualized rate for GPT 4. 
Uh, and perhaps even more amazing is that you're not just paying 10 times less for the same model. With GPT-4, you actually got an improvement of 4x larger context window and a 4x reduction in latency in addition to that 10x drop in price. So we're seeing dramatic increase in capability for a rapidly reducing price. One of the things we observed in 2023 is that open source models are gaining ground quickly on important performance benchmarks. For example, here we've tracked the performance of both private and open source models on the MMLU benchmark. MMLU stands for Massive Multitask Language Understanding. It's a multiple choice benchmark across a range of subjects that seeks to capture the general knowledge and competence of large language models. What we've seen over the past few years is that the latest open source models are improving on this benchmark more rapidly than private models. The most performant models are still private models like OpenAI's GPT-4 and Google's Gemini Ultra, but the open source models are closing the gap. And as open source models become more performant, they're attracting attention from academic institutions, startups, and even large enterprises who want to be able to customize and experiment with large language models beyond what they'd be allowed to do with private models like GPT-4 or Gemini. A big part of it as well is the potential cost savings. Why pay extra for a private model if you can fine tune an open source model like Llama or Mistral for greater performance per dollar? So it's encouraging to see that open source models are improving so quickly along this benchmark. While it can be very useful to compare model performance on a specific benchmark like MMLU, the advent of language models are forcing research to, researchers to evaluate how to best track and compare the performance of models. Part of the solution to this question is tracking model performance across a variety of benchmarks. For example, GPT-4 outperforms average human performance on the National Biology Olympiad, the BAR exam, the SAT, and even the Advanced Sommelier exam. But it still lags human performance on tests of common sense. And there are other axes of performance that users care about besides accuracy or general knowledge. For example, Stanford released a framework called HELM, the Holistic Evaluation of Language Models, which factors in metrics like robustness, which measures a model's resistance to typos or, say, variations in language, or that captures the biases that a model has to try to more comprehensively measure language model performance. One increasingly common question we get is, Will this rapid increase in performance continue, or will we see a tapering off in how quickly models are improving? Uh, and one of the things that we consider in terms of the gating factor to uh, generative AI performance is how much training data these models have access to. Uh, and when you look at frontier models like GPT-4, uh, they're really trained on all of the public, uh, publicly accessible internet data that we have today. And so some could look at that and say, OK, that's, that's it. We don't have much room to run, and these models are going to start plateauing in performance. Uh, but we've looked uh, beyond just what's available on the public internet. And we actually think there's a significant amount of runway available to train these models on more and more data, assuming that we have enough compute. And cost decline suggests that we will have enough compute to train these models on more and more data. A great example are social media platforms like X which we estimate generates 25 trillion uh, uh, annual tokens of data from its uh, massive base of users per year. Uh, just that alone is more than what GPT-4 was trained on, and that's the entire history of the public internet. Mark Zuckerberg recently, recently said in Meta's earnings call that they also have more internal private data than the entire common crawl data set uh, that feeds into some of these models. Uh, if you go even beyond uh, kind of the new content being created and posted to social media and think more broadly like the total amount of words that are spoken per day that could be captured by speech to text models, we estimate that is roughly 40 quadrillion uh, training tokens per year that could be captured uh, and fed into large language models. Uh, even beyond spoken words, uh, models are increasingly multimodal, meaning they're able to take multiple forms of input for example, both text and image and video and audio, and then generate those uh, different types of mediums as output as well. Uh, and when you start thinking about robotics use cases in particular, which require a, a strong sense of perception of the physical world and an understanding of physics, uh, we think this could be a really important set of training data in the future, something that a company like Tesla is very over-indexed on uh, rel relative to their competitors. Uh, so we think there's a lot of room to run in terms of uh, using more diverse forms of training data to improve model performance. Uh, the key will be uh, researchers understanding the best way to use that data and have it efficiently impact the model performance. Stepping back from the, the research on the technology side for a moment, 
uh, we think it's really important to, to connect this kind of top-down thesis for how quickly AI is improving to what it means for the companies that are actually building and deploying software that uses artificial intelligence. In trying to understand what this means for companies that will be building and deploying AI-based solutions uh, as enterprise software, we did an assessment of the traditional enterprise software space and observed this spectrum of uh, value capture that these enterprise software companies are able to generate. Uh, and, and what we found is that the more horizontal, commoditized use cases, things that are, are relatively easy to create and deploy, uh, have a low percentage of value capture uh, for the ultimate business use case that they satisfy. And solutions that are highly differentiated and highly specialized have a much higher uh, value capture percentage. And that makes common sense, right? If, if a solution's easier to create, then it will be more commoditized and there will be less willingness to pay uh, for the end customer. Uh, and, and one thing to note here is that there's kind of this clustering around a 10% that some of the largest categories of enterprise software like uh, a CRM solution from a company like Salesforce has. And we think that's a good indicator of, of a midpoint of where uh, AI-based enterprise software could center its pricing in the future. When you take that insight and zoom out to the global scale, we estimate that we'll be paying nearly $30 trillion in knowledge worker wages by 2030. And if you imagine that software vendors can capture 10% of the productivity gains on that $30 trillion of knowledge worker wages, uh, with the potential to increase those knowledge workers between 2 to 6x by the end of this decade, we think that gives justification for an explosion of growth in the enterprise software market, growing from roughly $1 trillion in software spend today per year uh, to upwards of $13 trillion by 2030. Uh, and that growth in this market, we think, is variable based on how much of this absolute productivity gain actually gets realized in the economy by the end of the decade. We're seeing strong signs from uh, professions like software development and consulting that there's material productivity gains to be had today, maybe even 2x for some functions of some jobs. Uh, but how generalizable and how quickly that proliferates throughout the economy is yet to be seen. Uh, our work on cost declines and analyzing rights law suggests that uh, this could happen quite quickly and, and more rapidly than the, um, the majority of the market suggests. Uh, so I've, I hope you've enjoyed the uh, breadth of our research on artificial intelligence this year. Uh, it's, it's particularly interesting when you look in the context of this entire deck because we think artificial intelligence is the most convergent technology where its uh, cost declines and its adoption rate uh, accelerate the cost declines and the adoption rate of other innovation platforms, perhaps uh, most notably autonomous mobility and multiomic sequencing. Uh, so it's, it's very important to kind of take this as a base understanding and then use it throughout the rest of our research. Uh, and, and Brett Winton has done a great job in our convergence section this year, seeing how the, all those pieces play together and what it means for how the market for disruptive innovation is going to grow between right now and 2030. Uh, so to get the full details on that report, head to arc-invest.com and look for Big Ideas 2024.